Jan Wenner's autobiography tells the story of a man who built an empire. We've heard a lot in recent years about the death of rock and roll, not just as a genre and a sound, but also as an industry, a way of life, and, most importantly, a galvanizing force. What we haven't really heard until now is a full-throated inside account of how music came to define American life in the first place, beginning in the late 1960s and continuing today, written by the man who channeled that revolution into a magazine, Rolling Stone, that became its own cultural force. To be clear, I worked for Jan for a dozen years or so in the 1990s and beyond, and I crafted an oral biography of Rolling Stone's most famous writer, Hunter S. Thompson, at his request and with his assistance, so I'm not the most objective reader of this memoir. In fact, I went into this book expecting to know most of its narrative and many of its stories, but I was constantly surprised by its detail, scope and range, and emotional depth. So, yeah, come for the celebrity gossip. From Jan's breakup with John Lennon to his later closeness with Yoko Ona, from his years as an Ernest Mick Jagger fanboy to becoming the kind of millionaire mogul who strikes business partnerships with Jagger and vacations on private islands and private jets with him. Among the rock and roll is plenty of sex and drugs, but stick around for the inspiring story of how a college dropout with a big idea turned his vision into an empire and changed the country and the world in the process. Jan also writes extensively about his earliest male attraction his tense but enduring marriage to his wife, Jane, and his joy in raising children with her, as well as his decision to tell Jane, in 1994, that he'd fallen in love with a man, Matt Nye, with whom Jan now has children. It's easy to forget now that we're more than a half-century removed from the era in which Jan founded Rolling Stone, and understandably more focused on the ongoing revolutions of technology and social media, and, perhaps, democratic versus authoritarian modes of governance, but the world Jan grew up in was dominated by a kind of conformity in which the realms of pop culture and politics were kept as far apart as possible. Enter drugs, social protest, and the burgeoning West Coast folk, psychedelic, and rock scene, which centered on Berkeley while Jan was a student there. Once he had the idea to start a magazine that combined all of the above between two covers, he never looked back, and the next couple of decades of his almost manic, feverish life is a whirlwind of struggle, drama, scoops, ambition, success, failure, mentor issue, more. from Woodstock to Altamont, Watergate to the Monica Lewinsky scandal, draft evasion to the military-industrial complex, nuclear power to global warming, Rolling Stone was there had a point of view, was embedded with the key players, pushed things forward far ahead of most other outlets, and called it like they saw it in a way that frequently incinerated the status quo. Against a backdrop of his friends and family dying Hunter, Robin Williams, Amit Erdogan, Tom Wolfe, David Bowie, and his dearest and oldest friend, his mother, his own myriad health and injury setbacks, and Trump, the antithesis of everything both he and Rolling Stone, ever stood for, ascending in the White House, Jan admits to taking his eye off the ball at Acrucia the fact that the world Rolling Stone had reflected, chronicled, and created, one in which rock and roll, formerly the domain of dirty hippies and commie draft dodgers, had suffused almost every aspect of our lives and had helped elect a president of the United States Bill Clinton, who welcomed Jan and I and our national affairs editor, William Grader, to the White House after he was elected, was now on the decline, and that the culture and demographic Jan isn't bothered by this, he's not a revankist tilting at windmills, wishing us all back to some golden age.